This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. No other figure has impacted history like Jesus, but today he's often seen as just a myth. So what does the historical and archaeological evidence say about Jesus? Well, archaeologist Dr. Titus Kennedy has investigated firsthand the discoveries connected to Jesus' birth, ministry, crucifixion, and resurrection. He's visited and excavated where Jesus walked and also examined the artifacts connected to Jesus' life and put it all into a book called Excavating the Evidence for Jesus, the Archaeology and History of Christ and the Gospels. And Henry's here to talk with him about it and a few of these evidences. Dr. Kennedy is a field archaeologist and has been involved in excavations and surveys at several archaeological sites, including the Kerbet et Tel excavations and the Jerusalem Mount Zion excavations. Here's Henry. Titus, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Good to have you. Thanks for having me back again. All Good right. To be here. You're becoming a veteran of the show. We're very happy about that. Uh, before, you were on the show to talk about your book, Unearthing the Bible. But today, we're here to talk about your new book, and I think people are going to be very excited about this, Excavating the Evidence for Jesus. So let's begin by talking a little bit about some of the early part of Jesus' life. Now, one of the uh, items we want to jump in, we have a lot to cover, so we're going to jump in right away. I wanted to ask you, you know, there's stuff out there on the internet, and you know, for pretty serious people about the Bible. A lot of it seems like silliness, but it impacts people. One of them is, you know, there was no village at Nazareth in the first century, and therefore what the Bible says about that is illegitimate. Let's let's talk about uh, Nazareth a little bit, if you would. Well, that was a concern from an archaeological standpoint in the past, because not a lot of work had been done at Nazareth and we also didn't have these first century inscriptions or, or other first century sources outside of the New Testament talking about Nazareth as a functional village in the first century. But as more archaeology was done at Nazareth, we understood then that it, it definitely was a first century village. I mean, you look around the Church of the Annunciation excavations that have been done there have found materials from the first century. And then you have this uh, Church of the Nutrition excavation that was done, uh, Ken Dark involved in that, and how they found this first century house underneath the church. Uh, so there are tombs, there's pottery, there are fragments of ritual stone vessels from the first century, so a number of things from different areas of Nazareth, uh, even around the, the Mary's Well and some of the water installation areas that show us, yes, this was a, an occupied village in the first century. And, and the primary occupants were Jews that observed the Mosaic law. So it, it fits quite well with the Gospels. Yeah, it, it, your, your point is well taken. We didn't, we didn't have the evidence, but you know, this is one of those basic fallacies that's out there a lot. We talk about it on the program a lot. You're obviously familiar with the argument from silence. We have something in a t- sacred text. Uh, we don't have a correlation with archaeology, but... We have found over and over again in time, we just give it time, we end up uh, finding those kind of correlations which you describe. Now, you lay that out in your book, and again, we want to mention uh, Dr. Kennedy's book, Excavating the Evidence for Jesus, is available on the ABR website. Okay, so, you know, we're talking about Jesus' life, you know, uh, in Nazareth. We're going to just go backwards a, a little bit and talk about the, uh, related to the birth narratives. And of course, we have this very significant event that's recorded there regarding the Roman census. And this has been a point of controversy in scholarship and New Testament studies and so on. And you cover this in your book and uh, it's good that you do that. Let, let's talk about that and talk about what you, how you see the issue. So the, the primary criticism of the whole census is that Luke must not be getting the timing right uh, to coincide with Matthew's nativity narrative. And then additionally, it's usually said that Luke is talking about the wrong kind of census and some of the protocols are not there. And this is actually one of the sections in the gospel where a lot of scholars, uh, even Christian scholars who think that the gospels are historically reliable, 
would say that there's an error. So they'd say there's a small amount of errors in the Gospels, and this is one of them. But I think that we have sufficient archaeological evidence and, and other material from ancient historical texts that really explains what's going on here and that Luke is getting things right. So first of all, Luke says that there is a census of the whole Roman world that Augustus ordered. And in the records of Augustus, he talks about three censuses of the whole Roman world that he ordered. And one of those was in 8 BC. That's the only one that's close to uh, the 4 BC death for Herod, just a bit before Herod's death. And then uh, he says that Quirinius was a ruler in Syria at the time. So Luke uses a very general term for this. We don't know exactly what the Latin uh, Roman specific term would have been, but he's some kind of ruler. And if we look into the life of Quirinius, we see that he held many positions, including governor, but he was also a legate of legions. He was a military commander. And at this time, that was his role in military commander. Uh, we even have him in the area of Syria. There's a very important Latin inscription. It's an epitaph. And it talks about a census that was ordered by Augustus that is being carried out by a particular officer. And Quirinius is the legate who is over him. And it's in Syria province. Now, Syria province had jurisdiction over Judea as a client kingdom at this time, at the time of the birth of Jesus. So all that connects. There's more about Quirinius that we could go into and, and sort of two governors idea in Syria province. But all of this fits quite well. You know, we don't have the exact date written in Roman records, just as we don't in the Gospels, but we can, we can make a good guess as to when that time was. Yeah, it's very good. And, and again, I think it's a, it's a matter of carefully studying the text, looking very closely at it. So we want to, again, recommend folks pick up Dr. Kennedy's book if they want to explore this issue further. We also had an episode of Digging for Truth on Quirinius with Brian Wendell in the past as well. Now, uh, I want to turn to what I found to be a really intriguing discussion that you had about the Star of Bethlehem. So give the audience a little taste of the bigger picture of the Star of Bethlehem, and then we'll talk more about it in the next segment. Well, the Star of Bethlehem, sometimes it's also called the Star of Jesus or, or the Star in the East. So this is the star that the Magi saw that led them to the, where Jesus had been born, led them to Jesus, and they associated it with him, uh, possibly because of a messianic prophecy. And many people have been trying to figure out, you know, when did this star show up? What exactly was this star? So there are different theories about it in terms of uh, conjunctions of planets or some specific star or a planet or a divine light or an angel. And so I was looking at the text of Matthew and looking at uh, other ancient Greek texts that use the same word and idea and, and then this other document called the Revelation of the Magi and just trying to piece together what, what made sense and is it restricted to a, a certain astronomical event or is it something else? Now, you have some good material in there explaining the background of the Magi, where they may have come from, Persian connections and all that. Uh, so we encourage people to pick it up so they can read that. But what I'd like you to do is explain further what you see in the text, what the meaning of the, the word aster is in Greek, the word star, what it can mean, and what your, you know, your, your looking at this leads you with a little bit of a different alternative interpretation. Yeah, so aster can mean many different things. And this is one of the first issues that I was looking into in terms of what, what does this have to be or what can this be? It, it can be a star, of course. It can be a planet also. But one of the other uses that we find in ancient Greek literature is uh, some kind of angelic being that is emitting a light. In fact, in some, in some sources, it's used as an angelic being emitting a light, guiding someone, like guiding a ship safely to a port or, or through a storm. So this, I thought, all right, that's, that's something that connects a little bit more, makes more sense with the idea of 
the star taking the magi to the house where Jesus was, exactly to the house. So a star, as we think of it in English, can't do that. A planet can't do that. And we also have this appearing and reappearing that's happening in Matthew too. So that, of course, we could say, all right, a cloud came over the rotation of the earth. But but the way that it's talked about, it's like something that's in very close proximity and it pinpoints exactly what a house is. And so that led me to think this is, this is not a normal star. It's not a conjunction of planets. It fits more the divine light or, or angel guiding light. And then I, I read this revelation of the Magi, which is, seems to be a second century AD source, the extra biblical it's not, of course, going to be 100% historically accurate, but it is interesting that we see what people thought about the Magi and this, this whole event at that time. And the way that it describes the stars also as this kind of divine, divine light um, or angelic type of being that is emitting a light and guiding them. And so that coupled with the idea that you know, astrology is, is something that's written against in the bible and especially in the old testament you know that led me to not go with the idea of it's a it's an astronomical event that gives an astrological type of sign and instead it was some sort of a miraculous thing that god engineered specifically for this event yeah and and i i, I really wanted to talk to you about this because i had never seen this before and I was intrigued by it, but but I, I want to encourage the audience that we're not deviating here from the biblical text as I reflected on what Dr. Kennedy is saying. You know, the text does have this broader range of meaning, and particularly the house, Titus, I thought that was a strength in your in your argument. You know, like how how did a star go over a house? Like I, I've always wondered about that, and I never I never thought about it further. So we leave that for our audience to consider when they pick up a copy of the book. Let's keep moving though. Um one of the places that's a key place for Jesus's ministry in the, in the Galilee, we're going to jump ahead here now, is to Capernaum. And so we have got the synagogue there and uh, potentially Peter's home. So we're going to shift subjects, but let's talk about that because there's a lot there to discuss. So Capernaum was this seaside village on the coast of Galilee and we've got two really important pieces of architecture there that are mentioned in the Gospels that have also been uncovered in archaeological excavations. We've got the synagogue and Peter's house. But when you go there and you see this white synagogue, quite impressive, most people are thinking, oh, okay, is this the synagogue that Jesus walked in and, and taught in and cast out demons? But it's not. We have that first century synagogue underneath this one, but it is preserved enough for us to know things about it. It's got the, the black basalt walls preserved up to about three feet. And it's in the, the same general plan as this newer synagogue. But the excavations there show that it was in use in the first century, in the early first century. And so we know that Jesus was there when this synagogue existed, the black basalt one. And that's the one he would have used. And so the gospel writers got that correct. But when, when we read about Peter's house, especially, I think it sounds like it's very, very close to the synagogue. You know, immediately they left the synagogue and went to Peter's house, arrived there. And if you walk from the synagogue to Peter's house, it takes you maybe 10 seconds, it's just down the street. And this, the Peter's house thing, of course, there's going to be more debate about that because it's not as identifiable architecturally but <clears throat> it was turned into a church very early on maybe uh, late first century and then we see that this the walls get plastered and people start etching things on the walls graffiti although not in the the modern sense of graffiti and this graffiti is often praising jesus christ so we see that it's a, a christian meeting place but there are a couple that also mention Peter there. And then we've got later pilgrims who come even before the official Byzantine church was built. And they talk about how it was Peter's house. So there is a long tradition of it. And there's no reason for us to believe that it wasn't Peter's house. He left. He ends up in Rome, right? It makes sense that he would have 
let the Christians use his house that he didn't need anymore to meet in as a church. Yeah, that that all uh, seems to fit very well together. The proximity, the biblical text, the context, the tradition tracing back, all very good stuff. Now, speaking of tradition, you know, we've got the phenomenon of Byzantine churches built at places in the biblical world related to events that occurred or supposedly occurred. Let's talk about that a little bit. Who were the Byzantines? Why did they build churches? And what are some of the significant places they built churches related to Jesus? Well, the Byzantines, that's a term that we use. It's essentially the the Christian Roman Empire. So we're looking at Constantine and later. And why did they build these churches there? So, So Constantine is the one who started this whole trend. Of course, he's not the only one, but many of the early Byzantine emperors were the ones who built these churches. And Constantine started with a focus on sites connected to important historical events in the life of Jesus. And the the purpose seems to have been to preserve these places and to commemorate them. So they wanted people to remember the events and the places and for them to be preserved for the future because the historical reality was important. So Constantine had churches built in places such as the birthplace of Jesus, the tomb of Jesus, and then crucifixion site, or presumed anyway, uh, the pool of Bethesda, and it seems the pool of Siloam probably, although they may have had it over the wrong part of the pool. And then, then we see many later churches that Constantine didn't build, but they were later emperors. And we looked at the one at, at Peter's house, so that was a 5th century church. And we could go throughout, you know, the Nazareth, the Church of the Nutrition, one was built there. Uh, we also have the Church of the, on the Annunciation in Nazareth. It's quite early, too. So many, many places. And when we investigate these things archaeologically and historically, we find that the accuracy of the locations is, is excellent. There may, there may be some Byzantine churches that are off in their, their location for an event, but the early ones especially seem to be quite precise. People often have this idea in their head that the Byzantines just sort of picked the spot and made this church up, but that's, that's not at all how it went. You know, they asked the local Christians where these things happened. They, they even investigated them. They removed previous structures like Roman temples that had been built there by Hadrian, and, and then they, they built them trying to get them accurate. Uh, it's, it's totally different than what the Crusaders did when they came to the Holy Land. They did just not have an idea where most stuff happened, and they just built things where they thought it did. And so the Crusader churches are often way wrong in their location, but the Byzantine churches are almost always correct. Yeah, they, they really did their homework. And for friends who may be uh, un, unfamiliar with our previous excavation, we found a Byzantine monastery at Kerbet el which is commemorating something. Uh, there could be several different events that that's a possibility. One of them might be Abraham's altar. We don't know for sure, but certainly significant. Okay, so Titus, I wanted to ask you about some, uh, a, a discovery that has been slandered so badly that it often sort of gets put out of people's minds and that is the James Ossuary. I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. You kind of wrote a few years ago for Bible and Spade and got me kind of like re-engaged with that, of, of that maybe it's been treated a little bit unfairly. I think the James Ossuary is an extremely important artifact. Now, the main problem with this is that it was not discovered in a regular archaeological excavation. It was looted from a tomb in Jerusalem, probably in the early 70s, as best we can ascertain, and we even have, have ideas of which tomb it might have been looted from, but the, the content of it, or the, the inscription, the content of the inscription is very important. So this inscription in Aramaic reads, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And so when this was discovered, so to speak, uh, on the antiquities market and then uh, presented eventually, to the world, there was obviously uh, extreme interest in this. But initially, the IAA had a team of scholars that claimed that this was a forgery. And and it ended up in that big forgery trial that went on for a decade, which resulted in many scholars 
looking at this in detail. And it actually, it was, it was given back, the offshore was given back to the owner, and uh, there, is, there is nothing shown that it was a forgery. Actually, the reverse, you know, geologic tests show that the stone was the correct type of stone for the Jerusalem area and had been in a tomb. And then when they looked at the inscription, that was the main thing under question. First, they thought, okay, it's, it's all fake. Then they noticed the patina in the beginning of it. So, all right, James, son of Joseph, that's correct. Well, then they found that the patina, that this ancient residue, was also present in the Jesus part, the Yeshua part. And so the whole inscription had been made at once in antiquity and then stored in the tomb, as an ossuary would be. And so it, to me, it seems like it's a totally legitimate, authentic artifact. And if so, it could be referring to Jesus. Because this, the way that they go about presenting the name is, is very unique. Of all the ossuary inscriptions that, that have been discovered, only one other one we know of mentions the brother. So the brother was obviously very important here. Well, that other ossuary doesn't mention the father. So maybe the father was, they didn't even know who he was or something, or the, or the brother was famous. Usually it, your ossuary would mention your name and your father's name or your name and your profession, maybe your place of origin. So whoever wrote this is saying, James, son of Joseph, okay, that's an identifier, but even more so, brother of Jesus, this is somebody well-known, he's famous, we're tacking this on as an extra. And so we know, or we, we could say with, I think, a good amount of probability that this would be James's ossuary, leader of the Jerusalem church, who was martyred in Jerusalem in 62, meaning this is a first century inscription mentioning Jesus. Yeah, very, very significant. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, Titus, didn't mean to talk over you. Sure, so the inscribers are trying to be very specific in order to identify who this person is. And I think, as we explained with the brother part tacked on, <clears throat> this is somebody who would be well-known and who was important. But <clears throat> if you look in the writings of Josephus, he's aware of the familial relationship because he, he says that James is the brother of, of Jesus. And so people were aware of that relationship. And we don't know of any other James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And so it's, it's a plausible assertion to make that this inscription is talking about James of the Jerusalem church, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And again, we encourage folks to pick up a copy of Dr. Kennedy's book to check out his arguments and evidence related to the James Ossuary. Okay, speaking of things associated with death, we want to move ourselves to the farcical trial of Jesus, this plot to murder him, the only innocent man ever to live, who is caught up in this plot. Let's talk about the trial because you've done quite a bit of work on this. And it's really fascinating, the historical and archaeological trail that we can find related to the trial of Jesus. The trial of Jesus is one of my favorite narratives from an archaeological standpoint because of the massive amount of corroborating evidence that we have for the people and the places and the protocols or the, the historical context. Now, we've got Jesus, obviously, but then we also have Annas, the high priest, we've got Caiaphas, the high priest, we've got Pilate, the governor, we've got Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, and we could even throw in some side characters in there like Peter and also Simon of Cyrene. And then, of course, we have locations. So he, he gets arrested first in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we could start off there. And then he's brought to the house of the high priest. So there's two. And then He's also brought before the Sanhedrin, the council, and then he is taken to the Praetorium. And then if we were going to go after that, we obviously look at the crucifixion site. But so at least, you know, four locations, three of them, which are structures, buildings, and then we've got a minimum of five characters. Well, all these things are, are tested archaeologically. All right. So uh, maybe we could start with, uh, let's see, uh, Probably the most famous figure people known that uh, made its way into the Apostles' Creed. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. So let's talk about his office a little bit 
and the Praetorium, uh, perhaps, if you'd like to do that. Mm-hmm. So Pilate was what the Romans called a prefect. So this was a type of governor. And <clears throat> as such, uh, he, he had authority over certain things like capital punishment. And so that's the reason why the religious leaders of Judaism had to bring Jesus to Pilate to get him to sign off on the, the, the execution of Jesus. But we know some things about Pilate from Roman history, ancient writings, where he is referenced here and there, uh, early Christian sources also. But also in 1961, uh, excavations at Caesarea Maritima discovered this stone with a Latin inscription that was some kind of dedication to Tiberius by Pilate, and it gives his name, Pontius Pilatus, and his, his title, Prefect of Judea. And then much more recently, uh, a ring that had been discovered at Herodium long ago was finally cleaned and noticed, and it had Pilate's name and a symbol on it, the Pilato in Greek, so it's the same form of his name in the New Testament. So, you know, Pilate is a very well-attested person, governor, prefect of Judea. Then you mentioned the praetorium where part of the trial happened. And usually, tour groups, at least in the past, were brought to the Antonia Fortress area in Jerusalem. And sometimes they were shown this stone pavement, but that's actually from the second century when Hadrian did a, a rebuilding of Aelia Capitolina. So the, the praetorium, we actually know from Roman sources, first century sources, like Josephus and Philo talk about this, that the governors used the former palace of Herod the Great. So that was on the west side of the city. And in the 1970s, there were some excavations done there uh, with uh, Broshi and Shimon Gibson was part of that. And they uncovered this gateway and they uncovered a stone pavement and they uncovered a Bema area. And I think this structure that fits John's description also of Gabatha, like a raised place, which looks very much like uh, Bema areas in, in some other cities of the Roman world, like Corinth, for example. And you can actually see that still today. It's just that most people don't know where it is and it doesn't have clear signage for it. But we have probably the place where Pilate and Jesus were standing as part of that trial took place. Yeah, and you, you just imagine if you're able to go there, if you ever go to Jerusalem, uh, you know, that there's the question asked, you know, would Pilate ask Jesus, what is truth? You know, that these events are taking place there. They're placed, and you mentioned all these names, Herod Antipas, the buildings, Pontius Pilate, of course, the, that, the whole context. This is no myth. This is a... This is so rooted in historical circumstances and peoples. Yeah, it's completely different than a myth. So myths will often have some general geographic locale that they use. And then most of the characters are not historical. Maybe a couple of major ones are, but the actions that they take are not. And most of the other people are made up. Totally not the case here because it's not like it just says it happened in Judea province or even in Jerusalem. We get the specific buildings. And we've located those archaeologically. Hall of Hewn Stone on the south side of the Temple Mount was where the Sanhedrin met. The Praetorium, we've got uh, three houses of the high priest, possibly, that it could be. I think one is a better candidate. But all of the characters we mentioned, we have historical texts and uh, ancient inscriptions and like the tomb for Annas, for example. So they're attested archaeologically through a variety of methods demonstrating the the historicity of you know people and places and then we have other historical sources referring to the trial of jesus excellent well and and on top of all that we also have the caiaphas office ossuary which you talk about in the book as well the bones of the high priest who was involved in the conspiracy to murder our lord uh one thing you wanted to talk about a little bit was what we call Pilate's dilemma regarding the trial tell the audience about that and some of your reflections on that Well, in the Gospel of John's section on the trial narrative, he mentions this quotation where the religious leaders say that if Pilate doesn't do what they want, execute Jesus, that he will be no friend of Caesar. So this was political terminology, a friend of Caesar. 
was someone who had the support of the emperor. And of course, you wanted that as a Roman politician, because if you lost that, you could be in serious trouble. Maybe you would just lose your position, but you could also be exiled somewhere or, or even executed if you did something to warrant such drastic circumstances. And the pilot had been in a, a variety of mix-ups with the local populace already. So he was a governor in Judea for, for 10 years, which was actually a very long time. And he was probably a typical Roman governor, ruling as others did with an iron fist sometimes. But uh, this got him in trouble in Judea and that there were multiple complaints against him. Things like the, the shields of the emperor that he put up in Jerusalem or maybe the eagle symbols or using the temple treasury to build an aqueduct, even if it may have been to supply the temple. So these were things that were offending the Jews. And so they sent official delegations to Caesar to complain. And Pilate was already kind of in a spot where he didn't need any more complaints. Otherwise, he might get sent home and then you'll see what happens. But in 31 AD, there was this whole Sejanus affair. So those that are familiar with Roman history will know something about this. Uh, Sejanus was the ruler of the Praetorian Guard. And over the years, he had amassed power to where he was almost acting emperor. Tiberius was off on the island of Capri, not really interested in running day-to-day -day things, and Sejanus had been amassing more and more power. Well, this turned into a conspiracy, basically, and the Senate ended up assassinating him, you know, faking that he was going to be made emperor and then assassinating him. They killed also many members of his family and uh, political allies. And so Pilate, even if he had no direct connection to Sejanus, was in a place where you didn't want to make the emperor mad at this point in time. And we can see then from history that in 36, Pilate actually had one more incident in the province and there was a complaint against him and he got recalled to Rome. Now, Tiberius died before he got there, uh, but Pilate, who knows what would have happened to him? Exile, execution, we're not sure, but he, he was under the impression and the correct impression that if he didn't do what they wanted, he probably was going to be kicked out of his governorship. Uh, that's great. That's great background material, and that's the background material of the expression, you know, no friend of Caesar. You know, it's kind of like you're no friend of Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's sort of bring a specter of fear even over a soldier like Pontius Pilate. Very understandable, very contextual, historical. Okay, so now let's shift to after the crucifixion. We want to talk about the tomb because— you know, that's a, a really important point. And we have the tradition at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There's been uh, work done related to that. It's been refurbished lately and some tests were done. But talk about the church and the tomb there and that tradition. So this the tradition for this church definitely goes back to the 4th century. But, but as I see it, it goes back to the 1st century. Why would I say that? Now, there are claims in the fourth century that and the fifth century also but that this was the tomb of jesus that hadrian had built a temple over the top of it and so hadrian did this at a number of sites associated with jesus in a, a campaign to try to erase the historical memory of christianity and, and to syncretize things with roman religion so he built a grove to adonis over the birthplace site in bethlehem he built a temple to the healing goddess Clepius over the pool of Bethesda. Probably he built a shrine to the nymphs over the pool of Siloam. And then he built this double temple to Jupiter and Venus over the tomb of Jesus. And in, yet in so doing, I think he actually helped preserve the location. Yeah. And so we can say just from those items that people certainly thought this was the tomb of Jesus. But if we look into the details of the tomb and, and the immediate area around it, archaeologically, architecturally, we see there's an even stronger argument. That is that we know archaeologically this area was a quarry that then was then turned into a garden in the first century BC and then used as a graveyard. There are other first century tombs 
very close to the tomb of Jesus and the Holy Sepulchre. And then if we look at the architecture of the tomb itself, it is a stone-cut, arcosolium, single-chamber tomb that was sealed by a stone. Now, not only does all that fit the Gospels, but this single-chamber component is extremely important because there are no other single-chamber tombs of this type from Roman period Jerusalem area at all. This tells us that it wasn't used in the normal sense that the other tombs were as a family tomb, and it was never reused either. So there was this immediate recognition that it was important that it was the tomb of Jesus. And because of that, the local residents didn't reuse it later on. That's a fascinating array of evidence that connects all of that. And and it's it's really interesting to see the convergence of archaeology, tradition, and the biblical text sort of all coming together. And you weave that very well in the book on this particular subject and all throughout it. Now, Titus, uh, we've, we've been through uh, quite a tour of, of evidence, and you have a lot more in the book that you go through. You provide sources for people to have further study. It's easy to read for the layperson who's not familiar with archaeology, but gives them enough if they want to go further. So let's shift the discussion now to talk about historians and philosophers that mention the name of Jesus, either manuscripts or inscriptions and that kind of thing, because this is really, this is cool stuff. Uh, Let's talk about it. So just within the first and second centuries, we have 11 references to Jesus Christ by historians and philosophers. So this is material outside of the New Testament. And the vast majority of these are non-Christian sources. So we're, we're getting different people's perspective. We're getting Jewish perspective. We're getting Roman polytheistic perspective primarily. And then we are getting, you know, a couple of Christian perspectives from people who were Romans that converted. And so we, we can see that they must have thought that there was something to this if they were willing to convert. And, you know, I'm not talking about local Judeans becoming Christians either. I'm talking about people in the Roman Empire who were outside of the immediate sphere of influence. So I think that is really powerful evidence, first of all, just demonstrating the historical existence of Jesus, because this is something that often comes up in popular culture or or even in classes in high school, maybe even college, that there's no historical evidence outside of the Bible that Jesus existed. And that's not something that professional scholars in this field would say or take seriously, but it does get circulated a lot. And so I wanted to provide at the end of the book sort of an appendix on this so that people could look at who are these authors, you know, what's what's their name, what's their position, their date that they're writing this thing, the source, and then a quotation of it translated so they can read that for themselves and see that it's not just Hey, we're throwing out a number. A bunch of people said Jesus existed. Yeah, that's good. And you know, on our program, when we critique alternative ideas or sometimes bad ideas, we try to be as generous as we can. But we have to be honest. The idea that Jesus, the argument that Jesus didn't exist is just a foolish absurdity. And we ought to call it that. But at the same time, we show the reasons why we try to bear and be patient with people. I should mention, we had Dr. Craig Evans to talk about Jesus and the mythicists. So if someone's interested in that, uh, we urge you to watch those shows where that's developed further. So let's talk about uh, some of these uh, sources. What are, what are some of your favorites, uh, Titus? What, which ones do you like the most or do you think pa- pack the most powerful punch? Well, really, the Josephus one is very powerful, I think. Although people claimed in the past that it was a Christian interpolation or modification when that 10th century arabic version was found i think that that changed the perspective on things and showed us that josephus was just recording what people had been saying what they'd been reporting about the trial and crucifixion of jesus that he had disciples and then it says that they reported that he had appeared to them three days later you know he doesn't say that he believes that but he is at least saying here's what people are thinking But, you know, we also have uh, people like Celsus, who was a second century Roman, who was very harsh critic of Christianity. And yet he talks about the birth of Jesus and and going to Egypt and the miracles. And he talks about, you know, weird business with the virgin birth and 
and Jesus claiming to be God and so forth. So there are some really important things that he brings up and that he's aware of that tells us that the church didn't just invent things like the virgin birth and, you know, Joseph being a carpenter, Jesus going to Egypt, Jesus performing miracles, Jesus saying he was God. This was known even to critics of Christianity not long after 100 AD and, and perhaps, you know, before that too. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's interesting. We call these, uh, if you want to call it a forensic kind of way of, you call them hostile witnesses because they they don't have any skin in the game. You know, uh, I think it's unfair to the Christian sources to sort of dismiss those. But if you were to accept the premise that they could be dismissed, you you have these hostile sources. Another one is in the Talmud. You know, they 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 completely acknowledge the existence of Jesus. They reject him, of course. They even talk about his miracles. But he, they, you know, they say that uh, they were due to the power of Satan, which is, of course, blasphemous. But so we've got a lot there, uh, Titus. Now you mentioned also uh, a graffito, uh, Alex Menos graffito. Could you talk about that a little bit? I thought that was really interesting. This is what we have uh, as far as the earliest artistic depiction of the crucifixion of Jesus, and it was found in Rome on the Palatine Hill on a wall of a building. So it, it was something that had been etched there. Uh, by workers or soldiers or slaves. And, and then there was actually a response to it, but it's mocking Christianity and Jesus. So it shows Jesus on the cross being crucified, but he, it gives him the head of a donkey. And then it shows this Christian whose name was Alex Amenos, And it says that he is worshiping his God. So to them, the crucifixion was ridiculous, ludicrous, because they can't imagine a, a deity undergoing this capital punishment that was reserved for non-citizen criminals. And Paul you know, writes about this to the Hellenistic mindset that this was just something that, they, that made no sense to them, right? And yet, like you talked about the hostile witnesses, this is a very important piece of evidence that demonstrates the historicity of the crucifixion of Jesus. And again, that it was widespread knowledge. People knew about it, even in Rome. You know, this dates to about 100 to 200 AD. So it's, it's not too long after the time of Jesus and attesting to this event and his personhood. That's great. All right, Titus, I'm going to give you the uh, difficult task of giving us a summary because we've come down to the end, my friend. Wrap it all up in any way that you would like. So if we were to put the New Testament aside and just look at other sources for the life of Jesus, we, we could actually reconstruct so much of what the New Testament and the Gospels talks about archaeologically and from other ancient historical texts regarding his birth in Bethlehem and all these locations, some of which we've talked about in this show, locations of his birth, locations of his uh, childhood and growing up, ministry, trial, crucifixion, burial, and all these events in his life that he was a teacher, he had disciples, he performed miracles, he claimed that he was God. You know, all this stuff we have corroborated by sources outside the New Testament. And there's an incredibly strong case then for the life of Jesus and the reliability of the Gospels. Amen. And in, and you make a great case in your book and we urge people to pick it up. Titus, thanks for all you do and thanks for coming on the show again. Yeah, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Of course, there's a lot more in Dr. Kennedy's book, Excavating the Evidence for Jesus, so it's a pretty good resource to read through. You can get a copy anywhere books are sold, or you can also buy it from the ABR bookstore, and that helps out the ABR ministry a little bit. That's all for today. Until next time. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.